Hello everyone, welcome to the car clinic up here in Mayo Park, New York, home of TST. Uh, this is the second of uh, four uh, webcasts co-hosted by Motor Asian TST and Mike AC Servicing and Best Practices. Uh, I also want to welcome tonight, of course, someone you all know, Mr. G. Julia. Thanks, Pete. And, and we have a special guest, a good buddy of ours, Mr. Dave Hopkins. Hello, everybody. Thanks for thanks for tuning in to this, this uh, web seminar. We're going to learn a lot about air conditioning systems tonight, especially compressors. So we've got a big program in store for you. So keep watching that PC. We're going to bring some good training your way. Okay, just as like last time, I'm sure that probably bounced around with the mic, right? Just like last time, this is a live interactive presentation. You never know what's going to happen when things are live, so bear with us. Um, there are going to be opportunities for you to ask questions if we go wrong. Uh, we'll let you know uh, between each section when that's uh, time. So we'll save those questions for those times. And if you give me the uh, next oh, I don't know. Uh, I wanted to say a big thank you to our sponsors for tonight's affair, Delphi. They're the ones that made this possible so we can bring it to you free. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, next slide. And I do have to put in a little thing for us. Of course, this is also brought to you by MotorAge. And I want to point out that when you go to MotorAge.com, this is the page that you're going to see. Oh, my God. There we go. That's a live TV. <laughs> now, I want to point out, when you go to MotorAge.com, this is the page you're going to see. A lot of things here for you. Very quickly, you'll see the top print features that we have going on for the current month. A link here to join our online community, which is growing daily. I encourage you to join there and check it out. And uh, another very important item here is our digital publication, How To. So check it out and uh, let us know what you think of those items as well. Next slide. Here's what we're going to go over tonight. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about HFO 1234YF. If you're not familiar, that's going to be uh, considered the global replacement for our 134A. I uh, want to talk a little bit about how that's going to affect you. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about performing an AC service. Mr. Julia is going to give you the pointers that make sure that the service you do is professional and complete uh, and, and doing the best that you can for your customer. Next, uh, Mr. Hobbs is going to take over, tell us a little bit about, about how to keep the compressor healthy and happy, and then we'll uh, wrap up with any remaining questions and answers. We'd like to say, you know, we, we want your questions and your feedback as we're going through again, as Pete said, this is live, so we have some stuff already hooked up to a vehicle, and things may happen, but we're going to try to do our best to give you the information. So I guess, Pete, tell them about the new certificates. Yeah, one thing I wanted to point out on the, on the last one we did in February on Voltage Drop, and in case you haven't seen that, you can find that on our community site at MotorAge.com. But a lot of feedback we got was from you guys who are teaching and need CE credits for uh, NACAT certifications, and some of you just would like to have the certificate for uh, completion to take to your boss. So we're going to make that available to you tonight at the end of the webcast. So you have to pay attention on just how to get that certificate, but it will be available for you tonight. Slide there. So don't go and uh, go see some TV program or watch the ball game when we're on, right? Yeah, that's hey, true. Let, let me give you a little tip here. Okay, in, order, in order to earn the certificate, we're going to give you three codes during the course of the seminar, but you need to write them down. So if you don't have a pencil, pencil and paper handy, go get one. Write those three codes down, and you'll have to enter those codes in order to get your certificate. That is correct. All right, let's start off with a little talk about the new refrigerant. If you're not familiar, there's a new kit on the block, HFO 1234YF. Uh, let's say it's really new. Gosh, we've been talking about this for, what, three, four years at least now. Easy. Um, I think it was back in 2006, as a matter of fact, when the European Union issued what's called the MAC Directive, banning the use of R134A in cars for sale in Europe. So how does that affect us? Well, we have manufacturers that sell cars in Europe, and we import cars that are made in Europe, so they're not going to make too many different models to satisfy world demand now, are they? Nope. Uh, some of the candidates that were considered for the replacement were R744, and that's also carbon dioxide. R152A and R1234YF. Now, carbon dioxide is still, I don't know, I think it's kind of still on the table. Uh, nobody's come right out and said it, but uh, the EPA is still considering adding it to the SNAP list. That's coming up later this year. Uh, a lot of money's been spent on developing CO2 systems. 
but I'm concerned with the pressures on it. Yeah, those were like, what, 2,500 PSI on the high side. So not the kind of thing we want to keep in the cabin and car. Uh, they're going to use what's called a secondary loop system if, if they go with that. But uh, right now, that's, that's, don't count it out. Uh, well, the military spent a lot of time and money with CO2 using it. Yeah. R-152A, if you ever use that can of air that you clean off your computer keyboards with, that's the same stuff. The, the propellant in that can is R-152A. Uh, that's pretty much off the table, though, because that's flammable. <laughs> so that wasn't too good. So that was coming off the table. And that left 1234YF. That was a latecomer into the game. A um, few things about that, that chemical. The, the uh, next slide, I guess, for me. Um, the characteristics of 1234YF are very similar to R134A. So we're kind of used to how the temperature pressure differentials work. Um, not quite a drop-in, but close. It could use the same type of system with some minor changes to 134A. And it is slightly flammable. Yeah, but let's stress the word slightly. slightly. Very, very low. Um, very low. If you're interested, uh, in the Federal Register, I believe it was in March, uh, is, the, is the complete listing of the EPA's final ruling on 1234YF. They have several pages that address the issue of the flammability, the testing that was done. They do not deem it at this point necessary to have anything special in terms of, of detection for that issue. Uh, there are a few other things that they're requiring, but that's not one of them. I think their new machinery will be taken into consideration with the flammability. So even though it's very slight, uh, the RRR machines are going to be designed with that in mind. For Absolutely. Uh, well, we could even go back to R134, slight. Yes, slightly flammable at R12 right. Right. at high temperature. So this is in a safe zone, we said, slightly flammable. Yeah. Very, very slight. Uh, but because it's a new refrigerant, you are going to expect to need new equipment. Uh, this is a picture of the prototype uh, Neutronics identifier for 1234YF. I thought it was kind of interesting. I want to point out, if you look real close, you're going to see a little USB connection on the identifier. Expect to uh, have to be a mandatory inspection or, or, or identification before you connect this to a 1234YF machine. Kind of interesting why. If you get 134A in there, the machine thinks it's a non-condensable gas, and what do these new machines do? Automatic what? Perch. Perch. Yep. Yeah, but if it's 134A, the pressure will drop. The machine quits its purge cycle, the pressure rises, it begins all over again. Next thing you know, that big expensive tank of 1234 has been into the atmosphere. So we don't want that happening. That's expensive. Well, and this is not like the Father's Oldsmobile anymore, so you just can't reel the air conditioning machine, hook it up, and start taking stuff out. We're going to need the proper equipment to do this. Right. And, and I know, gee, you've got a plan to show us a lot more about that a little later on. Yeah. Uh, so expect, of course, recovery machines, recycling equipment to be new, different. Um, leak detectors will have to be uh, upgraded, and of course identifying equipment will have to be uh, be new for this refrigerant. You got the next one there for me. Uh, what to expect though? How's this going to impact you and your shop? You hear a lot of comments both ways about this. This is my personal opinion. Uh, GM announced they're going to start using it in the 2013 model year. I still think you're going to see some imports arriving on our shores in the fall of this year with this new refrigerant. So if you're in a dealership, you're probably gearing up already, waiting for the supplies and equipment to become available. Um, if you're a shop that does a lot of AC work, you may want to certainly consider preparing for this investment. Uh, the investment equipment is estimated between $3,500 and $6,500. So that's the capital expense that you're probably going to be facing sooner than later. Um, if you're an average shop, you don't do a lot of uh, dealer support for AC, or, or it's not a major part of your business, you might be able to go a few years before it becomes an issue for you. But it is coming. Don't don't question that. It is coming. Of course, we're not. Oh, I'm sorry. That's with the body shop world. I was just going to say that. Brand new cars. Uh, right. They're, yep, they're exactly. wrecked with 100 miles on them. So they're going to have to have uh, the equipment to do the job. And GM has officially uh, submitted a SNAP, significant new alternative program for, for alternative refrigerant. So it's not uh, maybe going to happen like 42 volt systems. It is going to happen. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Will those machines be backwards compatible at all? I was asked that a lot. They'll be dedicated to one more dedicated dedicated just like it is now. I'm sorry? State the question. Oh, okay. The question uh, coming in from one of the uh, viewers is will these machines be backwards compatible with 134A? No, just like the machines that you have now. One machine, one refrigerant. And there, there won't be a, a multiple use for each machine. And it's just like scan pools. Let's you know, take it out of the air conditioning. 
all true. Sure. Scan tools, a lot of them are not backward compatible. They have to focus on the newer thing they're we're working on. Right. So this is an investment like anything else. And the refrigerator will be there. There's money to be made. But use the right stuff. Very Very quickly, and this will be easily available when we archive the video for the for the seminar tonight. Just some websites if you want more information on 1234YF. That's not our primary focus tonight, but I do want to make you aware of it. Uh, so I guess at this point, can you change it one more time for me? Write this down. Your first code is 5656. Five, six. Write that down, 5656. Five, six. So at this point, I guess if you have any questions on 1234YF that we can answer fairly quickly, we'll go ahead and take those. If not, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Well, Pete, I have one for you while we're waiting for the audience. I heard that uh, cars, uh, electric vehicles like the Chevy Bolt, the Nissan Leaf were all supposed to come through with 1234 wire. Did that? Not yet, and I think uh, a big part of that is Honeywell and, and DuPont, who are partners in producing the 1234 wire, have said that they'll be set up to mass produce uh, this fall. So it's too late for this model year. Not, will it change? Uh, I think one of the big issues with GM's decision was not just the 1234 because it's, it's not mandatory, guys, that we switch over to this new refrigerant. Um, it's the carbon credits that they get for reducing greenhouse gases, and they need those carbon credits. So that may be one of their reasons for moving to that refrigerant. Is there going to be any change in licensing for this new refrigerant? Good question. The, the question is, will there be any change in licensing? Uh, the SAA committee that, that, that set up a lot of the new standards from 1234 is recommending that there be additional training because it is a, a mildly flammable refrigerant and has some other properties that are unique. According to the EPA's final ruling, that is going to be taken up under a separate ruling under the Clean Air Act. That decision has not been made, but according to what I read in that final ruling, um, the EPA right now is of the opinion that because of the current standards in place for training, that shouldn't be necessary. So we'll see what the EPA decides. Any other questions, Carl? All right, okay. Without further ado, we'll turn the floor over to Mr. Julia. All right, thank you, Pete. What we're gonna do now, guys, I'm gonna go over to this car here, Craig, if you can kind of follow me. And I'm gonna ask, uh, as we're going on this 2007 Jeep, I'm gonna explain some of the things that you need to do on today's vehicle with service in 134A. Number one, having the right equipment. For this particular car, we're going to be using this Flow Dynamics machine. And you'll notice over here, we have this uh, OTC machine, which is a little bit different. Not because they're different names, but they're different types of machine because of a J stamp. This is an older standard on this one. We'll show you if you can put that PowerPoint, I think, is up there. The uh, 2788 standard, this machine here, will make the recovery process and the evacuation process in a shorter period of time and do a better job. Now, I'm going to interject a quick Please. question there, Gene. Um, for, for the benefit of some of the folks out there, when we refer to these standards, what, what exactly are, are these standards? Where do they come from? These standards come from the SAE Society Automotive Engineer Committees. And because of these newer vehicles, with the accumulators in there trying to get refrigerant out, to try to evacuate the system completely in a short period of time, we all know we should, on an older machine, do a 45-minute evacuation, right? But basically, what do guys do? 15 minutes out the door, we're gone. These machines have a stricter standard and a better capability of evacuating the moisture out. And they also, like this for charging purposes, come with a calibration weight. And I want to ask you out there, when is the last time you calibrated your machine? What happens? We roll these things in and out. Boom, boom, they, they get banged around, right? Dirt and gook gets in your machine all winter. So what do you do? You just hook it up to the first car that comes in, and guess what, guys? We have a problem. You know, Pete, just said 11 ounces on a car, right? 11 ounces, okay? The older cars, we used to put three plus pounds in a car, right? You know, and we always think in this country more is better, wrong. It is critical that you use the exact amount of the charge, exact. And that means you 
you have to caliper. So that's why a 2788 machine has a little bit different of a standard than this older machine right here. Now, a couple of things I want to go over in our best practices, and I want you guys to kind of jump in. You know, the most important tools we have is our brain, our eyes, our nose, our ears, our hand. Over the years of running shops, many people have come in and they would say, my air conditioner don't work. Well, what do we mean by the air conditioner don't work? How many times on the old cars with vacuum bolts, the hose was disconnected, the air would go towards the windshield. The default mode on every single car is air always goes to the windshield. So, a consumer just doesn't feel the coldness on their body, correct? So again, they think it's an air conditioning problem. Don't just rush to go to your refrigerator. So what I always do is I do a visual outside look at everything. Inside, while we drive in the car in, I'm going to put the switch on. Do I feel the fan? Do I feel the air coming out of the proper ducts? And do I hear anything with the compressor coming? These are important things. And also take in the duct temperature. There were many companies out there, like Neutronics, like UView, like many other companies that had thermometers that would go on the outside and the inside to measure the difference in the from the condenser and so on. Please add in about thermometers. When was the last time you looked at the accuracy of the thermometer? The best way to go with thermometers is a digital thermometer. Now I know all of you out there watching this, this uh, broadcast have a little pocket thermometer. You live by it, you pop it in the dash, and you see what it's doing. I want to really emphasize that because today's system is becoming more exact, you know that from bumper to bumper with anything you do diagnostics on. Everything is getting to be more and more precise and exact. You really need to invest into a digital thermometer. Heck, I can remember an old Sun Air Care from, what, 20 years past. Even years past. went to digital thermometers on their AC R12 charging station. So it's not a new thing, but it is something you really need in the shop. Yeah, here's yeah. another two quick, quick sets for you. First, to go back to what Jim was saying about the machines. If you have one of the older style machines, that's okay. It can still do its job, just understand its limitations. Even on its best day, this is only going to pull about 80% of what's in the car out of the car. Even on its best day. And it's not going to be accurate anywhere near as much as the newer machines. If you have to go out and run out and buy a new one, if you're in the market, yeah, upgrade. If you're not, just make sure the machine is working just like it should. The second thing I want to interject is Steve has mentioned about checking the airflow. A lot of cars are coming with what? Cabin air filters. Ah, and cabin while air. there's not every time, the cloth cabin air filter will greatly reduce the cooling impact of size. That's no doubt. And a lot of people don't take a look at them. They don't, they don't look at them. We're also going to talk about something as far as cabin air filters being contaminated besides dirty. And mold, when was the last time you took a drip tube and gave it a little squeezy squeeze, okay? Because the drip tubes, the rubber sometimes sticks together, the water don't come down, the moisture stays inside the evaporator box, now you have mold. We'll show you a way to alleviate that problem. Look at this great cabin air filter, okay? This came out of a vehicle, not this vehicle, but it came out of the vehicle. Mercedes. And, uh, Mercedes. And come on, people just don't take care of these things. They get dirty, they get smelly, and so on. Sure. So, well, it, 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 I, I, sorry, pet peeve. Pet peeve, okay. So, uh, Is it a customer standpoint to check that cabin air filter? No. It's our standpoint, it's professional technicians should check that cabin You bet. Greg, I think has a question. Go ahead, Greg. Someone, I'm not sure if it relates. Uh, should shops use a thermistor instead of vacuum and uh, mercury? I think they're oh, talking about the thermistor yeah. temperature sensor. It's never be a con as long as it's not a contact type thermistor. If it's just an air thermistor, that'd be fine if you want to use that. Uh, and say a digital readout or, or, on a, uh, a laptop, whatever you've got, that would work just as well. As a lot of the so. digital thermometers. I know exactly the problem that Dave's talking about. The thermometer has the little temperature gauge up top. You know, where you can switch the head a little bit, the temperature kind of changes. You notice they all move a bit. Mm -hmm. You're really better off with some sort of digital type one. And some of it, years back, we used to put it on the right duct inside. Okay? Sometimes they want you to put it in the middle, depending where the evaporator is. I usually still go to the right duct. Also, if you have my enhanced capabilities with your scan tool, your scan tool can read the HVAC program or ahead, wherever that information is. Sometimes there's PIDs on cars for duct tip sensors. Not only the aspirated, 
sensor, but also sensors in the, the if it's a dual zone, left and right ducts, and also left and right floor ducts. So you can actually read the pin for the temperature, what's being measured at all four outlets of the vehicle. And what better than the scan tool to do that? So that's all sometimes high and low pressure pins. So we can see what's going on, monitoring the vehicle. Okay. <coughs> Another, yeah, great question. No, it's not. Okay. Another tidbit here, I have hooked this vehicle up, and I'm going to ask Craig to try to zoom in here. And the, you have to do this with the air condition system not running. Now, we don't want to show you how to hook up, because I have already done two things prior to hooking up. One, I've taken this Neutronics sealant detector, okay, and I checked the system to make sure this little ball that was up there was going to flow a bit, and that's what this little band is for. If it drops down in a short period of time, you may have a problem like this where someone put in the dreaded stop leak, right? It's just like, oh, you know, we're going to put the stop leak in there. Well, you may think that's not a problem. I don't know about you, but you know, my equipment costs a lot of money, and I don't want to ruin this air conditioning machine. I don't want to ruin that machine or any of my other tools, right? So, this is your first line of defense. And let's just clarify, too, for listeners out there, uh, what Jeter referring to some of the older Type 2 sealants that can cause a lot of damage to both the, the car and to your equipment. That is great. Right. We both got plenty of pictures to show it to you. That is true. You know, I'll tell you a quick story where um, a student was not using this, and he ruined two of his air conditioning machines <coughs> where the valves were just locked up, and lucky the whole machine wasn't totally tossed. Mm -hmm. A lot of money, and you can't do work. That material is like an epoxy. Exactly. So you're not going to flush it out with any kind of flush. It's in there to stay. It's like that product you get the big box stores to insulate your house, that great stuff, that expanding foam. This is not what you want in an automotive <laughs> air conditioning system. Yeah, you don't, you don't put this in. There's no shortcuts. Let's face it. You know, when you try to do a shortcut and it's not OE approved, you don't run into a problem. That's the bottom line, the real world. Now, the next thing is hooking up to this identifier. And I do want to say on a motor age site, we do have a whole video utilizing this. So we don't want to you know, waste the time here. And lucky I'll drop my connector here to the floor. But if I simply put this on there without checking for sealant first, I could ruin this machine. And this is money, guys. So we check it for sealant first. Second, we check it to make sure we have no contaminants. Now, one machine we don't have in here that I use, uh, I don't have it in the chute here, is a um, scavenger machine. A scavenger machine is basically run off air so I can take flammables out and I can take mixtures of R12, 134A, 22, whatever. Now, a lot of you go, well, there's no more problem with 12 anymore. Hold on. You heard of places like China and India, okay? You know what they're doing? They're dumping a lot of this because 12 is not being used much anymore anywhere in the world, right? It's really down to nothing. They're dumping that in a 134 container and they're selling it to you. Okay. It may have that nice brand name on it, but there's a problem. Yeah, Gene, that's not the only thing too. These guys are putting in 134A tanks. They look exactly like the real McCoy, but they also have uh, propane blends or hydrocarbon blends that can pose real problems. Real problems. If you suck that in your equipment or your service that vehicle. So you're saying you're buying a replicable refrigerant in a can that looks like from you know what you've been buying for years from your local truck or car store. They don't know that they're getting a counterfeit, but the only way you can tell is with a test. Okay. So you know if you don't have a Neutronics tester or some brand tester that does a good job distinguishing that, guess what? You may be getting yourself into deep trouble with mixtures of different refrigerants or a hydrocarbon. So if you detect a, a contaminant with like a Neutronics uh, uh, tester, then you, if you don't have a scavenger <laughs> system, ship the vehicle on down the line, let yeah. somebody else work on it, don't ruin your don't ruin your equipment. That, that is a consensus. That scavenger unit that I have it has a 50 pound tank on the back. We collect all of the refrigerant. It goes out to a special place that can break the refrigerant apart. You pay the fee, sometimes they give you some money, depending on how much usable refrigerant they can say. Okay. So that is something that not many people have. That's why we just not even support this, but we'll let you know. Uh, well, the other thing, too, is like, it's like I always told you, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. 
We know that 134A has been going up in price. So don't be shopping on, on uh, Google you know, looking for a good deal. The white box if, specials, right? Uh, if, if it's half price, there's a reason. And you know, the other thing I also want to add, sand in the tank to make it feel 30 pounds. Water in the bottom of a 134A. These are things that, you know, in speaking to, and I know we do have some great air conditioned people online in our audience right now, but these are things that they can tell you that have been done, where you dump a container out and you see water come out there, where you see sand or something that they've put in that tank. Again, not everything is being made here anymore, and with third world countries, they'll put anything out. Any question, Greg, before we move on to the next step? Nope. Okay. So the next step here after testing that is these two gauges, or well, we're on a car that's not running, I like to do this, I'm going to tell you why I like to do this. You'll notice we're approximately about 80-something pounds on both gauges, high and low. This tells me two things. First of all, this is a hot, sticky, lousy night here in New York. 80 <laughs> he degrees. feels he's like back home in Florida. <laughs> I don't like this weather. I just left Canada where it was cold. And Dave, oh, he's all over the place from Indiana. But at any rate, when it's the temperature of the shop and it's hot like this out, or even if it's 50 degrees, our gauges with the air conditioning compressor not running for a while, this is very important, they should both be equal and close to the Fahrenheit. So pressure in Fahrenheit is roughly a one-to-one -one until you get up to a certain pressure. So this is something I'd like you to do for, for what reason, guys? Why would we want to do this? We could check the clogs in the systems, right? We may have an orifice tube like this vehicle has, an expansion valve like, uh, or expansion block like other vehicles have, a clog condenser, a bad compressor. This is a good way of doing it. That's my opinion. If we have an overcharge or an undercharge, what do we see when it's in the equalized state? Ah, an overcharge. Let's say this had an overcharge and it wasn't 80-something degrees here tonight. Maybe we would have 90 PSI. And if it was an undercharge, maybe we would have 70. So to give you that type of idea of so how yeah, to use your diagnosis. Be very careful with that, though. You can have a, what looks like a low static pressure and, and have an undetermined amount. You really can't tell for sure how low. No, so you can't tell how low, but at least it's a good ball game to start with. One degree Fahrenheit to one PSI is a good conversion. So that's one of the things we want to do. When we start this machine up, we plug it in. God bless you. You know, one of the things, guys, is always safety. And before I hooked them up, I did use goggles. And a lot of people think, oh, we don't need it. There's also safety involved in what we do. You know, you're looking at a minus 21 degrees Fahrenheit for R12, a minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit for R134F. God forbid you get that in your eye, you won't have another chance, okay? The, the next thing that we'd like to do is this is going into a purge mode of course we purged it before but we would do a complete recovery a complete recovery on the system meaning all the refrigerant is going to come out first now if you don't have a self-purging machine and what do i mean by a self-purging machine a lot of machines have these little gauges temperature strips right and you need to manually purge that tank you need to take the non-condensable air out of it. When was the last time you checked that on your machine? Would that be a good idea to do just every day, like you drain your air compressor in your shop? Good idea, especially if you're doing quite a bit of air conditioning. Right? If you have a 2788, it purges automatically, right? Ta -da. As well as this one does. This is also a auto purger. You could get some of the other ones that are not 2788s and do that, but that is mandatory on that machine, and that's important. And speaking of maintenance, Jimmy, we're talking about purging the air. Let's be honest, fellas. I worked in a shop one not long ago. Every shop I ever worked in, another common overlooked area was changing the oil in the vacuum pump. Or changing the filter. There is that. There's oil in the vacuum pump. Or changing the filter when the machine said it was time to change. It was just hit the buttons and bypass and keep idle right going. Well, you don't change that filter. You're just sending impurities into your storage tank, putting that in the next customer's car, and reducing the efficiency of the system. It becomes like air conditioned aids. You keep yeah. spreading this stuff along. It's a disease going out there. So check your pump oil. Minimal, they should do it once a year. Because remember, if you buy a little a little bottle of pump oil, you you know you read it, it tells you it's sealed real good. 
And when you open it, the shelf life is not all that long, just like other oils, okay? You're gonna pick moisture up in it, it's not good. Your vacuum pump has to work real well. So let's go over this process again. We recover, dependent on your machine, dependent on if it has an accumulator, dependent on if you open your valves too much all the way, right? What happens? We freeze up the accumulator. Now that takes a longer time to take the refrigerant. Some guys don't wait for that, what do they do? They then go into a vacuum for a bit. They, evac they evacuate it a little bit, then they throw a charge in and they add some oil. That's not the right way to do it. We need to, number one, like look here on the vehicle. This has a one pound, uh, one and a quarter pound charge on there. You either look it up there or like behind us on all data or whatever, look at what they want in there. Know that your machine has been checked already, and then when we recover it, we evacuate it for at least 45 minutes on a non-2788 machine, okay? And if you can go longer, longer the better. Why? When we evacuate, we're lowering the pressure, we're then boiling something out. Another good tip is always, excuse me, always to get the car hot. If you get it nice and hot, it's easier to boil off the moisture and sure. evacuate it properly. One thing I like to point out here too, guys, when you're recovering the system, it's going to go all the way down to zero on the gauges and the machine cuts off. Before you switch over, let the machine sit for about five minutes. If you see the pressure increase, there's still refrigerant in the system. Do it again. And follow that process until the gauges don't rise anymore before you switch over to evacuate. I know you've all done it. I've done it. I'm sure everybody else who's on us will admit they've done it. You're in a hurry, you need to get the job done, you pull the system charge out, you crack open the system to do it, and what do you hear? <laughs> well, you know, technically, that's illegal. That's illegal to vent any kind of refrigerant to the atmosphere. And if you evacuate before you get it all out, yeah, you'll get more of it out, but when you go to purge your system and you see the purge lines frosting over and icing up, it isn't because there's air in it, it's because there's refrigerant. That's right. And that is, that is a big mistake that a lot of people really do make. Okay. And then when, of course, we, you know, we fill the system back up, you should see that all the refrigerant went in. You should race the vehicle up for a bit, see if the temperature comes down. Then you're going to need to do a couple of different things. We've all seen the leak detectors like this one here. This is J2791 compliant. This is a very uh, a very important new standard for very very small leaks. I forgot what the exact standard is. Quarter ounce year. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good, very good, very good memory. Now, these things work pretty good in certain cases. Dye works phenomenal in certain cases, and especially you know if you have a good black light like this particular setup here. And we were talking about this a little earlier. This happens to be from U-View. Nice light, adjustable. Your special die lights up real good. Okay, so you can see that. But one of the things that I, I think I heard down at Max first, or maybe speaking of Paul Weissman or D. Giuseppe, one of those guys there, where the die is different. The spectrum sometimes when you put the black light and you bought the die kit from whoever, XYZ brand, and you put it in and then you're looking for, you know, the leak somewhere. You're looking all over the condenser, the evaporator, the drip tube, everywhere. You can't find it. Couple of problems there. One, you may have too much oil that went in there at one point. Uh, wrong refrigerant charge not allowing the dye to go through properly. Or, you may have the wrong black light for that particular oil stain. And that'll be a problem. This light works real well, little handheld thing. The other thing that I like to kind of use is ultrasound. Ultrasound, and I'll give you a quick story on my daughter's car, because you know when you have to work for free, you kind of remember those jobs. <laughs> so my daughter was living down in Baltimore, and just real quick, she had an issue, it was the second time she had driven up here to New York and said, Dad, my system is warm again. I looked everywhere for that. I checked the charge, it was low, I filled it up, I went all over the place with the black light, with the beeper, nothing. I used ultrasound, and I thought I heard something. Even though I looked up the jerk tube, I thought I heard something. You can see on this thing here, we have these little, little lights that go up and down. 
Oh, is that moving correct? Well, of course, it ain't going to be blowing at you that much. But whatever, ultrasound picks things up quite easily. And what I did to verify that is I hooked my air conditioning machine up. I was listening. And as I took it all out, the sound was totally gone. As I put some in, I heard it. Then, of course, the dreaded job of removing the dashboard <laughs> and taking everything out. But just a side point, Jim. I mean, how many of you guys have been in the past have used the hose stuck up in your ear to look for exhaust leak? Yep. Sure. That's the technology right there that just gives you the hearing of a bat yep. to do the same thing. So not only just the AC leaks like you pointed out, but I can think of a hundred uses that you can use it to get on a car. Ultrasonic's been around a long time. Uh, back in the days of the carburetor, we used to find vacuum loops before smoke machines were even around. Right. Sure. Ultrasonic. Ultrasonic. Yeah, now a couple of things on oil. There's always the question, like this has an oil on it inside. Should we add oil to the system? Now, putting a compressor in, they will be covering that about oil in a compressor. Putting a component in, when I put a new accumulator in, should I put oil in? And the answer is yes. Look at all data, look at Mitchell, look at you know factory info. You need to add oil components. Now, what type of oil do we put in on a system like this where we're just pulling the refrigerant out, we're recovering it, we're evacuating it, and we're recharging it? Maybe it was low a little bit. Well, an oil like this that is approved, that has a 2297 approval, whether it be for a hybrid type setup or oil such as FJC, okay, which these are, you know, a special peg oil here. This is not a peg. Because a peg we can't use where? In a hybrid and AC hybrid electric compressor. That's right. And we're going to be talking about that right now. Because what do you do when you're out there? What do you do? You're going to can't buy a gazillion different machines. Here is a great tool that uh, we have this on the Motor Age site. And Dave, if I'm not mistaken, Delphi has something about this as well? Or you have a video you did? It's in our training course. Okay, so air set. So you, to reiterate, could you have two, could you use one AC machine on both regular cars and hybrids? Yes. Go one on machine. One. If you have this. Otherwise? Separate machines and you better have never used the PHG oil in those lines. With the one. exception of, uh, there is a, a couple machines on the market now that do have this built into it. They're very rare. Uh, I can't think of the one. Uh, Say, well, I might be able to help you with that. Okay. Um, there currently is a, a working on the 2788 that you explained for the new machines, adding an H designation to that standard to well, give, a, to give a procedure for, for clearing the lines. Here's what happened, guys. When you go ahead and you add oil to one of these machines, some of that oil stays in the line. And then when you go to switch that same machine to the hybrid, that oil can then be transferred to the hybrid. And it doesn't take but what, less than 1% contamination to cause issues and possible HV leak through the windings in the compressor. So that's the concern. Um, if you have a new machine and you've never, if you've never used oil injection, you're probably okay using it on wherever it comes in the door. If you have, then you need some way to make sure that that oil in the lines doesn't get to the car. This is a very good way to do it. Uh, some of the machines, I know the Robin Air has come out with a procedure to, to back flush itself. There's a kit for that. Right. Flow Dynamics here has it. They're all using that back flush. And it's all being worked on. It's all being worked on. That's a time saver, though. This is definitely a time saver. Good unit. Also, this company makes some nice screens. There's something else I wanted to speak about. When your air conditioning system is not working really cool, and like this, an orifice tube type setup, well, if you simply put a new orifice tube in there, well, we know you're going to run into problems, aren't you? So AirSet makes these great little screens. We gave them out at one of our PSP things, and Dave has one here. And you can utilize them to capture some of the debris. So rather than really a bunch of orifice tools or whatever, yeah, why don't you bring that over, Dave, so we can kind of give them an idea what uh, they have at AirSet. And this is, this is a great kit, and these are all the different screens, Craig. You can get in there on that. Mm -hmm. And the tool to put them in is right on the bottom. I like Vanna White over here. I'm getting Vanna White money. <laughs> you don't look like her either. Yeah, that's true. 
Okay, so this is something Meteor, thank you from Ersa. Um, some of the dye that you can put in, or oil, this set up right here that would connect, basically, from your view, the screws in to the cap here. You can see this is sealed, they're not going to take them apart. Goes in there. You have your little foam screw set up here. So this would be attached, and as you squeeze this down, it would then go right in to the system. Yeah, and I want to point out to you a little side note too with the, with the talk about the dye. And it's more on the training video that you'll see. It's called April Trainer. It's our AC issue. Um, covers a lot of this in, in a lot more detail. But the use of dye is like anything else. A little is good, too much is bad. And that's a big problem with dye overdosing the system that can cause issues all of itself. That's why this little screw adapter is on these kits so that it can make a precise dosage rather than just fill it up with the Very, dye. very important. Also, very don't be disappointed if you put dye into a system that you know is leaking and you can't find it, it may take a couple of weeks for it to circulate. And there's, there's more than one reason. It could be a small leak, but it also could be you have a compressor that has an oil separator in it. Now, the idea before the oil separators are to increase fuel economy, believe it or not, the less uh, work right. it takes to, to move that compressor, uh, the more fuel economy you're going to get. But what makes it easier to turn? It's not pumping all the oil. It's keeping a residual amount of oil in the compressor. It's not really a sump like the old days, but you can think of it in that regard. And so because you're not circulating the oil throughout the system as much with a compressor that has a separator, you're not circulating the dye that moves with that oil. So you get reduced efficiency of using the dye and one more reason for your ultrasonic leak detector. More to go. So doesn't that make it tech, guys? Instead of relying on just one particular procedure, the yep. more bullets you have in your gun belt, the more different ways you know True. of looking for a problem. And that's what we're trying to do here, Pete, right? We're trying to give you a lot of different bullets, you know, because we're not being paid by these companies or we have our great sponsor here, but we're trying to help you diagnose these type of problems. That's our objective. That's I got something here that I've used for years in my classroom in these bottles here in tubes made by FJC. It looks like I have water in a bottle and cloudy water in the other bottle. But I want to shake this up and shake this up equally. And I want to show you what, and Craig, can you get in there and look at those bubbles here? You can see oil and water separates, not rocket size. But this is any type of oil, and I've taken all different brands, OE specifications, whether it be PEG or POE. And this is FJC. Look at the difference. FJC starts removing some moisture. I've had some fantastic results using this and testing duct temperature, okay, with using this was lower. Now I know a lot of times that sounds like crazy stuff. And believe me, FJC, I don't get any of it for free or anything like that. This is some good stuff. So just a tidbit out there. You got a car that's a little tight on the dually. You may also want to put a variable orifice tube in. It's a, therm a, th a thermistor type of tube that actually changes with temperature. I used to get great results in limousines and vehicles that normally would have a problem with a fixed orifice. So a lot of the OEs, like Jeep, does use a variable orifice, and you can get them for the ethanol. So that's some good info. One last thing before I let these guys kind of take over, or Dave, I should say. Um, I want to show you something else that is another problem. A lot of times the mold, as we've seen before in the car, this is another good tool here, this little mister. You plug in, you put this chemical in there, by you view this setup, and you can help your customer by cleaning up their evaporator, you know, the smells of mildew. You get some of these cars that are real nasty. And I know there's a lot of, excuse me, these little bugs are starting to get me in the seat. There's uh, a lot of different um, cleaning agents out there. Some you put some foam up to the tube and clean out. But this is a nice, easy system. It's easy to sell to your customer, and I just think it's pretty neat. So you view, if you're interested in that, you can see this. Any questions, uh, Craig, before I do one last thing, and then we're going to move on to Dave. How do you detect, uh, how do you detect contaminated dye? Is there a, a way, right or oil for that matter? Contaminated dye or oil. Contaminated dye or oil? As in it's the wrong oil. It's the wrong oil. 
Um, no, no, because no, no. you're looking, that would be the same question as if you're looking at the engine oil and trying to figure out whether it's 1030 or... It would have to be oil. sent out to a chemist and that's going to be... Or you could be New York City that has a machine that has oil because they can figure for it, that, but there's no simple way. Right. There's no simple way. But I, will, well, I do want to say this on the oil though. Most service information providers now, especially for later model cars, with these lower refrigerant capacities, lower system capacities, uh, oil capacities, have a procedure for oil balancing. In other words, if you change a condenser, you put X amount in. If you change the compressor, you put X amount in. Right. Be sure to follow the procedures. Don't dump the full system charge in the compressor when you're replacing it and hope that's going to cover it. You know, uh, too much oil is just as bad as too little. Right, and we'll slow the compressor and that Slow the compressor, another problem is it coats the inside of the evaporator condenser and reduces their, their efficiency. You're going to get less cooling and less efficiency out of the system. Now, one other thing I would like to say is one of the problems I've come across in the past is refrigerant being stolen out of cars when someone goes into a parking garage or leaves their car somewhere. These little caps are good, even to see if the customer played around with it or they brought it somewhere else. You could put them on and heat shrink them, and you notice they have serial numbers on them. You could write it down on your RO and then know Mrs. Smith has 12739 and 12738, okay, on their car. Now, if they come back and these are missing, or there's some some other number on there, you know someone has been tampering with the system. And it's another reason for you to carefully check that car out for sealant and for any type of other refrigerants that are in We're going to switch over now to Dave, and he's going to show you some good stuff. We're going to talk about more hybrid stuff, and we're going to mosey over do some compressor stuff, and uh, as a note, will help them out. As a note, the, uh, the number you guys should have. Oh yeah. The next code, gentlemen. Let me make sure I get on the mic and you can hear me. The next code. Write it down. One three nine four. Two One codes three nine four. Thirteen ninety four. So we got this. Bingo. Fifty six no, fifty six. No, I'm sorry. Fifty six fifty six. Number one. 1394, number two, write them down. Okay, let's talk about, talk about keeping your compressor healthy. Let's talk about what can kill a compressor. And basically, just a few failures, you guys have all seen them. Metal, major, major failure, something came loose, something broke inside the compressor. You've got metal that just went, uh, that grenaded into the system. Metal debris is found in the expansion device, you, you know, your orifice tube. You're pulling out and looking at it. You're looking at the uh, the small orifice in the expansion valve. Uh, parts found in various other components. So there's the telltale. Nothing new there. Major, non-major failures. No metals, joint leaks, com component leaks, pressure relief valves. A good place to be putting your your leak detector and finding out if, if the uh, if the valve is leaking. Worn out internal components. You just plain worn out. What I want to do tonight a little bit is talk about compressors are like engines. I think most techs out there, you, you're really familiar with the engine, you've got your head around that, you, you've known that all your careers. And like engines have changed, so have compressors. And we go to pan over to some of these compressors right here. We'll look at the least exotic one first, and that'd be this uh, variable displacement compressor. Okay. So instead of having uh, you know, a V compressor, a single cylinder compressor like in years past, we'll compare that to the old 350, like a Chevy small block. You can put any oil in, you can have a quart low, a quart high, you're probably going to, the engine's probably going to live forever, right? Well, now we go into more exotic engines, you know, maybe a quad four, maybe, maybe some uh, little four cylinder direct injection, more finicky about what kind of oil they use and how much. It's the same way with compressors. This little V compressor, Variable uh, displacement compressor. There is the uh, little wobble plate or swash plate. And as I turn the compressor, we see just a little bit of movement right here on the pistons. By the way, this is the uh, piston ring, if you will, that can get scored up and cause a lack of compressor displacement. When the pressures change on the low side, what's measured inside the compressor versus what's coming in the compressor, that movement I just made right there, that's what makes it put out a lot more. So we have instead of a cycling clutch, we have a continuously variable compressor. Now it takes a little bit more oomph to turn the compressor and uh, we're making more displacement. Now we've got rid of the clutches on some compressors, as you well know, it's for the Euro cars, and we just simply make that wobble plate 
go back to a much less aggressive uh, position and like it should, like we showed you before, less movement. Now, hey, Dave, speaking of, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me point out something because the Jeep that we just looked at with G was, was uh, has a constant variable displacement compressor. Yep. And, and it's really neat if you look at the high side service port, there's a big little tag around there to warn you not to run the yeah. engine. So it's a clutchless compressor. And if you ran the engine without refrigerant in it, you don't have the oil because the refrigerant is not going to move the oil around with it, and you're not going to have a, a very long-lasting compressor. So just like the compressors that used to lock up and Norman made the little kit that the guy didn't want to get it fixed, pay the money, you put that pulley on there. Well, what are you going to do with a compressor that doesn't have uh, a clutch? You just can't unplug it and let it freewheel as long as it's not locked up. Hey, just let it freewheel. Don't fix the AC. You're going to have to fix the AC or you're guaranteed you're going to lose the compressor. Right. Well, let's say another thing. When they put these variable compressors on, you don't have that drivability issue of the in and out. Or are they banging it out? So it's a lot better. It is a better compressor in that regard. We start seeing them show up in the vehicles at the smaller and smaller engines. When you remember the sort of bigger VAs that still run the cycle compressors for years and years after the smaller vehicles got the variable displacement option. And more finicky, more moving parts, more things that can go wrong, more reason to be very exact with your methodology. This is a beam compressor. We've seen a lot of the uh, import cars, our Asian cars, usually a beam compressor. You get a close up there. You just basically can see the little veins, like a little bit of water, moving around, moving that refrigerant. The size of it is very small. The smaller the compressor, the harder it has to work to do the job. It's just like a small engine. We've got to make sure we have the right stuff, the right methods. And then finally, as Gene mentioned earlier, we have, uh, we have a compressor that's electric. And uh, like anything that's high voltage electric, we have to make sure that if we work on a hybrid, talking about hybrid vehicles, hybrid electric, at least 100 and some volts or more, as we talked about, you don't see these on the BIS systems that are the belt elevator starters like on the Saturn View. So like on a Honda, it's fairly new. Any of the Priuses from 04 up, uh, the Ford starting in 010 with the Fusion and then even the Escape, uh, all into this electric compressor uh, strategy. Showing the Nissan Leaf. There's tons of hybrids out there and total electric vehicles. Three, three wires coming in on the Generation 2 Priuses, that's 04 to 09, as well as Camrys and the Highlander and so forth. That's three phases of AC. And each of these wires could contain about 200 volts or more. And that's more than enough to, to cause serious injury or even death. So you want to go out there and get yourself some good hybrid training. Delphi provides good hybrid training at several levels, even up to a hands-on. My friend G here with TST and his company, ATTS. As well, Jack Rosebro, Craig Van Battenberg, ACDC, there's lots of good training out there, but make sure you get some before you work on a hybrid vehicle. You want to make sure you have Class Zero 1000 volt gloves and they're tested regularly. These protect you from high voltage. These skins protect rubber gloves from getting a small pinhole in. You also want to make sure you disable the system. So this is not going to be something to replace hybrid training, just a little overview. Like on a Prius or, or, or a, uh, a Nissan Altima, uh, the Nissan, let's see what else, uh, the, uh, the Camry and so forth, Lexus, on and on. They have some kind of orange plug somewhere. Ford has one that looks like a gas cap on some of their SUVs. But you pop this out with the gloves on, remove that. This is with the vehicle shut down, of course. And that, that lessens the, the likelihood that you're going to be dealing with high voltage going up front. It should shut the system down, safe enough for you to R&R &R a compressor. There's a tool on the market made by uh, several companies making these, but Fluke makes one I have. It's the Fluke 1587. It looks just kind of like a big Fluke 87 or 88, but it also has what's called a mega ohmmeter function, or mega. And what it does is it measures super high amounts of resistance because it doesn't take a few hundred ohms of leakage or, or lower to cause uh, a problem with a hybrid no-start. It can be several thousand or even tens of thousands of ohms resistance and it's called a partial leak. So what this tester does, it has a special lead that instead of sending out about a half a volt like a standard ohmmeter does, it sends out about a thousand volts, up to a thousand volts. Thousand twenty-three. So you put on the, the common lead here in the bottom, red, 
you put the special lead right here in the top, and then you go, say, alligator clip, maybe the chassis ground, and then you go into that lead right here, you press that leak test button, it puts a thousand volts into the orange cable, and you see if there is any kind of continuity being shown. It should such say 10 mega ohms when you do this test. So there's something you may have to look into when you service AC compressors. Because just like a regular compressor can lock up, and so can these, these can short out. And uh, G mentioned the right oil. But I just talked to Paul DiGiuseppe, the training manager for the Mobile Air Conditioning Society. And that's a great place to get service information and training, Max and ACS. And he clarified something for me about the oils that uh, the AC, no pun intended, high voltage AC compressors are getting. You don't want to use ester oil, POE, polyester, or just ester for short, with something we've used very well for years with vehicles that were retrofitted from the R12 that used the 500 viscosity mineral oil up to the 134A system with the pads. It seemed to be a oil that liked every system. Not so with hybrids. It is technically an ester oil that is used in the hybrid compressors, but it is a much, much more refined ester oil. Uh, Toyota has a part number in D11 that you must use when addressing a hybrid vehicle. It's a special high voltage insulating dielectric oil that has an ester quality. So don't just go get the can of ester oil out of your shop and use it in these hybrid systems. Well, we should say there is companies like UView and a couple other companies making the oil True. that is approved. So yeah, right. as the sticker says, on most of these hybrids, ND11 or equivalent. So the equivalent would be like you said. I think our buddy Pete has a question hey, or a comment. Hey, hey. Yes, sir. Bring the pair of bicycles. Real quick. We all know the, oh, yeah. we all know the old adage now, hybrids been around long enough, don't touch the orange cable. Um, I know it's working with an electric compressor, but doesn't Honda have one that's a, a mix? That's a good point. Uh, if I could uh, zip through some slides here. We're going to play a little zip through here. Give me a bunch of hits down. That can be to remove fast enough. We'll come back and get these here in a second. G covered quite a bit of this stuff. I want to get down the picture of the hydrant. About two, three slides from now, we'll see that come up. Right about there, right there. What you're talking about, Pete, there's a picture on your screen of the Honda dual scroll compressor. Now, I want to open this up and show you what a scroll compressor is to begin with, and then we'll see what a dual scroll does. junkyard compressor so I don't care anything about it. There we go. We'll talk about the magnet on the rotor here in a second. But the compressor itself, when this when this armature, I get a close-up of this, when this armature spins inside the winding here, and the winding is what we're wanting to make sure, because there's refrigerant with oil going through this thing. We want to make sure that winding doesn't get broken down just like a burn-up stator winding in an alternator or, or a starter motor. So that using the right oil. Well, now the winding's okay. This permanent magnet gets turned by the AC electricity coming in here. And we turn this unit right here. It has a little crank on it. Actually, a little counterweight, just like a crankshaft. When that thing moves, it takes this little plate right here and just moves it in a circle like that, kind of an orbital pattern. That's what makes this thing pump. All right. So any scroll compressor it works in this regard. This happens to be an electric version. Now what we see on the screen, if we go back over to our screen here, we see that scroll part is in the back. So I was showing you a Toyota compressor a second ago, taken apart, and that's totally electric. This is electric in the back third. The front two thirds is a is a regular scroll compressor turned by a pulley with a clutch. So you have just a conditional scroll compressor like we've used for years in a lot of the import vehicles for the front part. So when the gas engine's running the hybrid, we've got plenty of AC. But when the engine shuts down to save fuel, say the stoplight or the light throttle and takeoff, the back part, the electric, kicks in and we still have some AC efficiency to keep that evaporator cold during those times of auto stop for fuel saving the hybrid. But whether it's the Honda or the Toyota or the GM, Ford, whatever the compressor is, use the correct oil. 
or you're going to have a potential for a short circuit. And if a short circuit occurs on a hybrid, in fact, in this shop right over here, we've got a, uh, not a generation two that would have the uh, AC compressor, but we have a hybrid vehicle in here with an intermittent short circuit. It's setting the code uh, P0 or P3009. And if you have that occur for a certain length of time, the vehicle can be a no start, it won't move, all because maybe you brought the wrong kind of oil for it. So consult the manufacturer. That's a big thing you'll hear from OE compressor suppliers like Delphi is whatever the manufacturer, whoever it is, whether it's General Motors, Ford, Honda, Toyota, whatever, make sure you use what they say. If we can go forward for a few slides, here we cover a few things here. And how are we doing on time? We're good, yeah. We're good? All right. Let's go way forward here. Oh, too far. All right. Do we need to cover that code? Is it for a clutch failure or? Huh? Which one? What did it say? Oh, one of the first slides. I skipped down to look at the, uh, the compressor. Oh, because you said a few forward. Well, we're on the subject. But with this compressor, Dave, we should say, you know, make sure to use the right oil. Be careful with voltage. So this is not like doing a regular AC service. We need some hybrid training. And the right gloves, definitely. You don't want to shock the experience because <laughs> someone put the wrong oil in it. Anything so. over 60 volts, even less than an amp, can be fatal. Yeah. I noticed in your shop you have the little shepherd's hook, the, uh, as Ford calls it, the technician release tool. Right. That is the, somebody's being electrocuted and they can't let loose. Right. The person in the next bay trying to help them, you don't want to grab them and try and pull them off. Even if you have gloves, you'll be unlucky, they'll hit your arm. Exactly. You want to make sure you have that tool and you can buy those the same place you buy the gloves where people that do the real high voltage work daily and it's not it's not going to be something you may never work on here we are in a regular aftermarket shop and there's a short circuiting intermittent short circuiting hybrid the next bay. all right so oil charge very important the oem approved double goes for hybrid electric compressors uh, the oem recommendations for servicing hang oil for 134a mineral oil for 12 we all know that, but there's also three different kinds of 134A for the most part. The 46, the 100, and the 150. All Delphi compressors use the 150. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. But you yes. lubricate your O-rings. I forgot to mention that at the bottom of that, that last slide. Lubricate the O-rings with the 500 viscosity mineral oil that you've been using for the R12. It's not going to be an issue with that oil circulating. It's just an issue keeping that, that O-ring nice and lubricated for installation. Dave, okay, just one thing on that 134A with the PAG oil. That is, for again, for a non-hybrid. Exactly. Make sure PAG for the non-hybrid and not ester, a special ester oil. A hybrid compatible ND11 with a Toyota or equivalent, like from some of the manufacturers of oils now that are making hybrid compatible oil. Uh, evacuate for 45 minutes. G spoke on that already. Recommended. We definitely want to emphasize any time a compressor is replaced. And this has been the main thing to do forever since we were young techs working on cars in our 12 days is replacing the receiver dryer or the accumulator, the desiccant bag. One drop, I think is what you said. Right. One drop. G, one drop pretty much loads up. Now you're not really going to see one whole drop of water with some condensation in the system add a little bit of air leaks in, but it will add up over a period of time to get that one drop. This is totally loaded up. Also with the new receiver dryer, you're going to have a new screen because the screen gets plugged up and now you're not going to be moving that, that, that liquid through this unit to a boil it off. That's the point of the receiver dryer design is to boil any liquids off before they come to the compressor. So reduced efficiency. Uh, other problems occur with an old receiver dryer being being reused in a system. So don't make the shortcut and say, you know what, I can sell this job uh, more, less expensive than the next guy. Yeah, you will for a while. Then you put, put one on later when you have the warranty return. Let's go to the next slide here. Speaking of warranty returns, if you want to reduce your chances for a compressor comeback, you want to keep the new replacement compressor healthy, definitely install a, a filter on the liquid line. So that's going to go in the line. There's a little tip on using it. You can see the junk that these things catch. And if it gets plugged up, it's just going to reduce the system flow. You're going to have a cooling problem, but not another bad compressor. So these can be cleaned out and reused. Now a little tip 
for installing these, I've learned from my uh, friend John Brunner, who does Max classes, what you do is after you cut the line to install this, and then you carefully remove any burrs from the pipe, and you then put your little, uh, your ferrule nuts, slide those over the, the pipes, and then the, the, uh, the, the ferrules themselves, and then the O-rings. Do not put the O-rings in first. Go ahead and tighten the ferrule nuts over the compressor, compression fittings, tighten it up with wrenches as if you were uh, going to do the job and finish it without the O-rings. And what that does, that makes that compression on this inline filter, then remove it again and lubricate your O-rings with 500 viscosity mineral and put them back on the lines and tighten it up with the O-rings second. So make your compression first, take it back apart, and put the O-rings in next. If you don't do it that way, you stand a great chance of ruining the O-rings and having a leak when you install this. Now you have two headaches. You've replaced the compressor, you sold the filter, but now you had to recharge it because you lost all the AC out of the system. Dave, they do make ones that fit right in to the system between a condenser or the bolt-in models or ready to go, ready to go, with no yes. cuts without. This is a doing. universal. That's so universal. You don't have that available for that particular application. The universal, I think, Aircept makes those. Yeah, they have nice. They some of them are flat. Piece of line. Yeah, they have all different stuff. Exactly. Let's go to the next slide here. And there's some of the junk we can see in compressors. As Gene was talking about that air conditioning aids, if you have you have air in the system, you have uh, other contaminants in the system, it's just going to go right to the next vehicle. It's also going to get in the system, plug up the orifice tube, and cause other damage. You go to the next slide. Hey Dave, real quick, I want to interject something here as well. I know you showed a lot of pictures of the damage, and I know, I know, I know that there's guys. He just out, knows. I just know there's guys out there right now who are grabbing that little can that they put the uh, flush in. It's got the little hose in the blow tip. Yeah. I know you're going to get into more detail. <laughs> I, but I had to say this right now. Uh, yeah. They ain't going to do it. Okay? Not going to. Dave, our main day, going to show you why not. Ain't going to happen. Yeah, I agree. The, the flushing is not what it used to be, guys. I'm going to show you why. Uh, in the back of the compressor, as we talked about, we showed you the kit from Airset. Now, a lot of OE compressors are coming with the screens already in them. But if you've got a compressor job and you don't have a screen in the suction side of the inlet of the compressor, the various sizes in that kit we saw earlier, there they are. There's the tool in place actually being installed in the back of the line there. So do it right the first time. Sell your customer a suction side screen. Protect that new compressor so we don't have the heartache of a second, third, or fourth warranty compressor. Next slide. And oil. Uh, G mentioned more is always better. Not. Not. We want the right amount. Remember, you can put six quarts in the small block Chevy. You can put four quarts in. Eh, who cares? It's probably going to run forever. You can put Wolf's Head or, or the, you know, uh, Kindles, Bob Alling, whatever. Put them all in. Put that stuff off the shelf of the discount store that has no brand on it. You do that with a Ferrari, you do that with a Lamborghini, you're, you're just going to have a ruined engine. So we've got to have the right oil, we've got to have the right amount. Too much oil, what's to do to a gas engine? It's going to start foaming and so forth, it's not going to move, pressure is going to go up in an AC system. Too little oil, a lack of lubrication. It's real common sense stuff. Now what do you do to make sure you get the right oil? It's called oil balancing. So an oil balancing basically means, you look at the spec, all data, Mitchell, what is the spec that compressor should have? You get your new compressor, well, what's in it? You don't know. If it's a Delphi compressor, some of the part numbers are shipped out with oil in them, some aren't. There may be a, a compressor that can work in an R12 or 134A application. So you don't really know. And if it's somebody else's compressor, unless you've got experience with them, you don't know what they're going to send you. So take the new compressor and drain it and see how much oil is in it. Then most manufacturers, and there'll be a label in the box telling you what to do, but most manufacturers will say, okay, what would the oil compressor have in it? It had X amount of ounces in it. Okay, then the new compressor, you put that much in it too. I prefer to use the specifications out of Mitchell or all that. Also, if you're replacing another component, let's say you're doing an accumulator along with the compressor. What is the accumulator supposed to have? Look in the charts for your specs. What's in a condenser? Let's say the compressor uh, blew apart, grenaded its guts into the condenser. You've got junk in there. You're not going to do a flush. We'll tell you why here in a second. You go ahead and replace that condenser. What's this capacity of oil for the condenser? Add all those numbers together. 
what you got out of the compressor, what the compressor should have, and each individual component, and then add that into the compressor. Once that oil, the right amount, and the right kind of oil is in the compressor, turn the compressor. You don't want to just throw the compressor on the vehicle and call it a day. What you want to do is turn it. Now, this particular compressor, I can probably get the spanner wrench on and turn it like this. But if you can't get a hold of your uh, compressor faceplate and turn it, they have a tool here. We'll go to, there's, there's a picture of the tool. The next slide, there's a part number. CB 149, 10049. Most all good auto parts stores, especially ones that sell Delphi compressors, have this tool in stock. It's what, 10 bucks. You screw it into the front where the nut is, and uh, then you've got a little flange here for a, what did I bring with me, three quarter inch socket. You simply turn, turn the nut like that. Give it about 10, 15 turns, complete turns, and you pre loop the compressor. You wouldn't put a camshaft in dry, right? So don't put a compressor in dry. You may have oil in it, but circulate that oil first, then start to back up. Don't start a dry compressor. Just like adding oil to the oil filter before you do an oil change. Go ahead, next slide. There's that uh, tune-up uh, refrigerant oil leak sequence and all that kind of stuff. We talked about that. G gave a good uh, lesson on how to use the Neutronics uh, sealant detector. Next slide. There's some things we're going to see. Actually, one more slide after that. There we go. There's the green death. You heard about the black death. There's the green death you know, on, the, on the expansion tube in the compressor itself. This stuff, like I mentioned earlier, it's like epoxy. It ain't coming out. Speaking of ink coming out, let's talk about the flushing system. Let's go, I think, one more slide down. There's pictures of it. There's recycled dirt in use for catching, catching contaminants before they get in your machine. One more slide. Here we go. Uh, condensers that have desiccant bags in the side of them. Don't overlook that. Toyota's big one using yep. that. So you may not see a condenser looking receiver dryer. It's built on the side of the condenser. One more slide. Speaking of condensers, the big reason, Pete said, you're not going to take that little rubber rubber uh, adapter or your shop air and squirt whatever, <laughs> brake clean, you know, you name it. Uh, all manufacturers have their little say on what kind of flush you should use, what's within OEM specifications, what's within the aftermarket compressor company specifications. What my old friend from Delphi, Jim Resetet, always used to say, he said, the people who give the warranty make the rules, and that is so true. So whatever brand of compressor you're installing, their rules fly with what you can do to flush. Whether you can use refrigerant to flush, of course General Motors promotes that. Uh, other companies say just replace parts if you suspect a, a component is being uh, restricted for flow due to contaminants. But let us talk about something just practical. Forget the rules for a second. This is practical stuff. Now on the screen, that looks kind of big. Hey, I can get my flush through there, flush all the crud and metal particles that might have got stuck in there. Think again. Let's look kind of close up here, Craig, of what we're seeing here blown up a hundred times. This is the real thing. I'm going to get up here close to help you here. I'm going to put my light on it. Actually, can I have you put the light on it, Pete? All right. Now, just to give a reference here, you can see my fingers, but you can see a toothpick. That toothpick tip won't even fit in one of those holes. Tex, this is not a brand new 2011. This stuff's been around for a, almost a decade. The condensers are getting smaller to be lighter for fuel economy and to make it more cost effective. But also, the result is you're not going to flush through that. Nickname for this kind of condenser that has these small passageways? Filters. That's kind of what they are. Can you flush a filter? No, you replace a filter. So if you suspect a condenser has gone south, it's got contaminants in it, go ahead and replace it. You're not going to flush it. It's just like Pete said, it's just not going to happen. And make sure you replace it with an OE or OE equivalent. A lot of aftermarket ones don't live up to it and okay. give you cooling problems. All different types of flows, tanks on the sides, tanks on the top, those that don't have tanks, cross flow, parallel flow, you name it. Lots out there. So what we need to make sure we do is get out of the, the mode of thinking you're going to flush crud out of these things and get into the mode of thinking we're going, to, we're going to price out that component and sell to the customer why you're doing it. 
You know, if the other guy down the street prices 50% lower than you because he's not going to put on a dryer, an accumulator, not going to change his condenser is full of junk from the last uh, grenade compressor, then what you need to do is make sure your customer realizes that you're the shop that stands behind your work, you're the shop that attends training regularly, you're the shop that's going to be around there next week, next year, 10 years from now when they have problems again or actually don't have problems with that system again. So, some correct refrigerant charge is critical. Remember, the right amount of oil is the same thing with refrigerant charge. What happens when the refrigerant charge is added incorrectly? Um, the old days of your car coming in the shop, it's a little bit warm, could be a little bit colder. Hey, I'll just put a can in for the do-it-yourselfer. Or, hey, I'm a shop and I've got my big refrigerant machine, I'm going to put a half a pound in myself. Those days are gone. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. You're going to have to recover, as G said, and then recharge with the correct amount of refrigerant. These systems that have, what we say earlier, 11 ounces, Toyota teeny tiny ounces, amounts of ounces, refrigerant. Absolutely. If you go 15 ounces, the pressure goes up tremendously. In fact, I tuned in to one of your broadcasts, G, when you talked about that some time ago uh, in another, another class on the similar subject. And uh, it's, it's prevalent out there. Techs are not keeping their machines calibrated for the right amount of charge. You're putting too much in. What happens is higher pressure. What's higher pressure due to performance? Well, boils gas law. The higher the pressure, the higher the temperature. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature. Why did we have to cycle the clutch for years? Because the pressure got too low in the evaporator and you get icy. Too high a pressure, what's that do? That's going to not only make it hotter, and you're not going to have as good a cooling, but the pressure gets too high and a compressor fails. So the right amount of refrigerant moves the right amount of oil, but the incorrect amount of refrigerant either won't move the oil or the pressures will be too high and we'll have problems to resolve. So again, we talked about oils, a review of oils, the right oil, if it's a R134A, it's a PAG oil, but if it's a 134A hybrid, it is a special hybrid oil to use for sure. So compressor balancing, we talked about, they may come in, they may have half charge, they may full charge, drain it out, put the right amount in. And last slide we have here, we have some issues, the wrong kind of flush. That, at one time, was an orifice tube, and it has really expanded out. It is like putting a, uh, uh, a uh, dishwashing rubber glove into the parks cleaner. Yeah, melt that. Not going to last <laughs> long. So whatever wives tell you listen to, maybe it will work for a while, but eventually you have the meltdown in your compressor job. So use the right stuff and it will be a success for you every time. Any questions for Dave? Right, let's go quickly up to where we were. Why don't you do the honors, Dave, give him a last code. Last code for certificate, 1080. 1080. Put that in, and uh, you'll be able to print out your certificate for attending tonight's webcast. All right, let me go ahead and give you a rundown of that if one of you guys have managed the slides. I know we're getting kind of close. I'm glad you guys stuck with us. Once again, we run a little, little past our original hour. Uh, let me go ahead and get a little closer to you with the, with the mic. <laughs> like I told you, fellas, the benefits of doing it live. Um, this is a new thing that we're trying to, to meet that request for certification, especially for you guys who are teaching and need the NACAT uh, CE credits. So uh, we're going to use a, a friend's site, autoservicetech.com. That's step number one. Log on, and down at the bottom of the home page, you'll see webcast certification. Click on that link. It'll take you to this page. There are quick directions there to recap what I'm telling you now. But the first thing I want you to do is click on the zip the downloaded file. Uh, or download the zip file, Elmer Foot Syndrome, yeah. uh, to your desktop. When you click on that link, you get a little window. Next slide. It tells you automatically open with is the one selected. Pick the one that says save file, save it to your desktop. Next slide. Once it's on your desktop, right click on it and select extract all. This is very important. Open the zip file and extract all to your desktop. One more. When you do that, this window is going to open up. Double click on the file marked index, and if you did everything right, you're going to see this. 
That looks like something I'd want to print. Hey, thank you for participating in tonight's AC Services Practice Seminar. Click on the arrow up here at the top. Um, you'll enter your, your three codes that we gave you. I'll recap them real quick for you. The first one, 5656. Follow that with a forward slash. The second one is 1394-1394. Another forward slash. The last one is 1080-1080. Hit enter. If you did it correctly, you'll see a sign that says you entered the correct code. It asks for your name. Enter your name, and then you'll come to this screen allowing you to print out your certificate of translation. That's, that's their bingo prize. That's their right. right. bingo prize. And if they, if they made a mistake along the way, can they call you at home? <laughs> Actually, Don't go that far, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my email address is on there. I will help you through any problems that you have with it. Okay, next slide. Uh, real quick recap, too, for upcoming Motor Age TST events. Uh, June 9th. Our, our motor agent Tony Martin will be coming up to do the TST circle. Uh, that it will. And of course he works with motor age as well. Tony's come all the way from Alaska. This will be a good simulcast on Thursday of that night. So you can sign on. It is a paid for presentation. It's three and a half hours. You get a, a download of the handout and our TST newsletter. Yeah, but let me just point out, the TST is a nonprofit group. Um, you're not going to get better training opportunities than you can with, with, with Gene and his gang. Thank you. Uh, our next one will be on August 25th when the good folks at Bartech are sponsoring the TPMS service and repair. We'll cover some of the more common problems that techs are having out in the field with these systems and find ways to help you address them. Yeah, we will. At least we don't get a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and then November 22nd, uh, we'll be back here with Dave Hobbs in Delphi to do uh, some fuel system diagnosis. You can get a complete list of the upcoming seminars and register for the ones that you want, including others offered from, from Advanced Art at surgeonofparts.com slash 2011 webcasts. Next slide there. Thank you, Craig. Uh, of course, we also want to point out that there's a lot of avenues, as Dave said, about finding training. This is a really good place to, to go and find those initial opportunities. It's ASE.com. We support the ASE certification. If you go to the home page, click on service professionals, then prepare to test, and then lastly, aftermarket resources, you'll come up with a whole listing of very good training resources that can help you in your careers. Including TSA. Including TSA. Definitely TSA. But well, we also have something here. If you're going to take the ASC test, a ASC test is actually pushing the lead out, or getting the lead out, as they like to say. And we're not talking about Led Zeppelin here. They go into a computer-based type test that yes. will take to the center. And what a great training aid, like if you're interested in air conditioning, here's the Motor Age A7, they make just about all of them, right? Click the uh, button there for me there, Great. So this is a good book that you can get past the ASE.com, Motor Age Training Guides. Yeah, very quickly, Motor Age Training Guides, uh, we, do, we produce something like 43 different titles covering all, of course, the A-Series. We now have the A-Series available digitally uh, that you can get immediately uh, past the ASE.com. And if you aren't just studying, uh, they make some pretty good resources for general information to improve your, your troubleshooting and repair skills. Yeah. Don't forget to look at the magazine. Great, great. Sure. And uh, of course, again, we want to take a real big thank you to Delphi for letting Dave come out with us yes. tonight. Thank you very much for having us out. Thanks, Dave. Dave. Gee, good seeing you here in New York. Yes. Yeah. Next time, keep the warm weather your way, wouldn't it? <laughs> and um, thanks for that point of credit. Well, thank you very much, Pete, for sponsoring uh, with the whole mechanics of all these monthly webinars. Yeah, it's been a great experience for all of us. And of course, one big thank you to Jay McGang at TST, Craig Manning, the camera and computers here to keep us all alive and, and going, our, our director producer. <laughs> thank you, Greg. <laughs> and the service manager here at the shop as well. <laughs> yeah, chief, Jack of all trades. Chief, chief cook and bottle washer. <laughs> one more slide, Greg, and we're out of here, I think. Um, yeah, that's, that's my man. You can take, take and, that out. And of course, my company, if you're interested in hands-on training stuff, uh, ATTS, Automotive Technician Training, that's where I make money. But don't forget, check out our TST stuff, and I want to again thank Dave for coming out, and of course, Pete here, it's a pleasure working with both of these guys. And most of all, thank you, we appreciate your time. Any last questions for the guys? Yeah, any last questions before we go? We have a few. Um, do you recommend using a micron gauge to make sure you evacuate it to the proper level? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, we actually put that into the latest Delphi training 
HVAC update course. And uh, it's, it's, if you're wondering where you get that, it's like 150 bucks. It's not that bad. And you can get it anywhere where you can buy parts and tools to service residential AC. What it is, and the question was, do you recommend an AC micron gauge? A little round gauge, just like a fuel pressure gauge. When you pull your system under a vacuum, how much vacuum do you really have? Is your pump up to snuff? She talked about, do you change the oil? Have you even thought about it? You even know there's oil in your vacuum pump. I know all the years I worked for my dad in the family shop, I never, I'm sure he did, but I never thought about changing the oil. I just thought about making money. I just thought about turning wrenches and making a flat rate. So if you don't have a good operating system, how do you tell the difference between 27 and 29 and a half inches of vacuum? You need the 29 and a half inches of vacuum or you're not for 45 minutes or you're not, repeat, you're not going to boil out the water from the system. And so even just a simple recharge could go south on you. So how do you tell if your gauge is so inaccurate, trying to see the difference between 28, 30, whatever, use the micron gauge. In digital, it will, 750 microns or greater is enough vacuum to blow that water out for uh, 45 minutes. So that was a, it's a good question, and I encourage techs to, to step up the level a bit and get a gauge like a micron gauge for pulling systems under vacuum. Yeah. Um, can you vacuum for 45 minutes and 20 minute intervals, someone asked of their machine. Oh, some of the machines do shut off in different intervals. Yes, you can. You can stop it, put it back on, do another 20, another 20. Some some machines do that. They time right. out after right. a bit. The 2788 machines are automated. Yeah. You can you can override that and run it manually if you're an old timer like myself. You just want to do it yourself. But you can just punch in, you evacuate, it'll pull it out, it'll pull it down, it'll keep it down, and then it will do a leak test to see if it bleeds off. Right. How do you know if a system's slimed up? Question is, how do you know if a system's slimed up? You're going to have to open it, that's for sure. Well, you're going to see some symptoms. Yeah. If the slime, or if you're talking about refrigerant uh, sealant or any other uh, contaminant, you're going to see pressure problems. You're going to see cooling performance problems. So, I mean, obviously the vehicle's in for performance problems or it wouldn't be in the shop. They don't do, you know, a uh, annual health check of, of the AC systems typically. So you got a no, a no cooling complaint or a low cooling complaint. You put your gauges on. If you're any kind of inclination at all, you have an issue, then like G said, it's going to have to be opened up and looked at visually. Right. And remember like we did with the gauges in the beginning. Look at the ambient temperature, a quick check, and stay in the ranges that are normal. Somewhere in a 30-something pound range running, right, Pete? Well, let me tell you, too, that's something else. Again, I can't stress this enough. You decide over here, sir. Uh, I can't stress this enough. You've heard me say it before. You've seen it in the articles that we write. You cannot go by general rules of thumb anymore. That's why we have service information. That's why the OEM service information is available. Look up the specs for that vehicle. Look up the pressure specs for that vehicle, the, the charts that they use, and go by that to, to determine the performance of the vehicle. A question uh, for you, G, on on the sliming up. Question to me. I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If it's slimed up, it's because of contaminants. Right. Now, it could be contaminants just the co compressor grenaded and sure. there's part of where that. But it's something is. else. You, you use the term slime in your question. If it's something else, if it's a, a sealant or some unauthorized refrigerant additive of some other nature, should we be able to hook up our refrigerant contamination? Uh, De detector, the tester, the neut neutronics uh, uh, contamination? Well, first we want to check the sealant to make sure that no epoxy is going to mess up, mess up our, our tester. Our test. Right. So if there's an epoxy base in here, then you have so to So we check for sealants first, and then for contaminants. And then we would need a scavenger machine. If we found if contaminants. We found if we found contaminants. Without sealant. So a two-step process if you want to look for that if, the, if you suspect it's slimed up, and if the slime is a contaminant and not a byproduct of compressor failure. And it's, again, yeah, it's a very a very good investment to buy the seal detector, the sealant detector, and the refrigerant detector. Yeah, we just that small that. amount of money is going to save you big dollars and time. Right, right. right. And, and, and they've got the price reduced. I mean, look, you can get a go, no go refrigerant identifier for about, as we say on ITN, 500 plans. Right. Yeah. So it's not hard. And the uh, leak 
detector or the sealant detector, that's about like 150. Yeah, that's yeah, that's very reasonable. Yeah. 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 Very reasonable. And you're not going to ruin it with sealant because it's got a little simple tool yeah. little with a sample at the end that's, that's going right. to detect that. You yeah. throw that away, so yeah. you're not losing it. Craig, our shop owner, can probably tell us a new machine costs. Yeah. Eight thousand, five thousand, five thousand, eight thousand, big bucks. So good companies like you know Flow Dynamics or SPX or you know uh, Robin Air type of stuff. Good equipment costs big money, so you have to save that. And remember what the dealers have been doing for years. Just like we were talking about twelve thirty four, you cannot put or do a service on some of these uh, AC machines that actually has the built-in testing. If it doesn't pass, it doesn't allow you to go. Right. And a lot of companies have started doing that. Oh, and I got a thunder send there before I forget. Uh, real oh, quick, guys. Um, if you work on AC systems for compensation, and that means that if you just accept a six-pack, you are required to be certified under the Clean Air Act, and you are required to have that card on your person in case anybody with a badge wants to see it. If you don't have that, you need to get that. Now, if you're Max certified, you can contact Max if you lost yours. They may be able to help you just replace it. If it's IMAC uh, certified, IMAC is certified, and you still have the card, that's all fine and dandy. If you ever got certified and you have the card, it's still good. But if you don't have it or you can't produce it and you need a new one, it's not that much to get one. You can right. get it through Max, you can get it through AFC, See, there's a few other uh, places so as well correct. that you can do it online, take care of that little issue in, in, in a heartbeat. I think it's like 20 bucks maybe to do the certification right. online. You know, if you get caught without it, with a man with a badge, I think it's something like five, ten, it's five, a ten, ten thousand dollar fine per day per occurrence. And it has been exercised. Uh, I think the specs I've seen were several hundred were inspected and I believe 86 were found in violation last year. And of the 86, only I think nine were cited. But I don't want to be one of the nine. How about you? No. Ten thousand dollars per day per infraction. That's right. I know we're getting real close near the end. Are there any more questions before we have to? No, we are out of time. Well, I want to thank everyone again. Thank you from uh, PSP and Motor Age, and of course our sponsor Delphi. Have a good night. Stay cool.